Ливии. Altitude and Decompression Sickness by Richard Van. Decompression sickness may develop after a dive when small amounts of bubbles grow as nitrogen diffuses into them from surrounding tissues. If bubbles remain small enough, the diver never knows they're there and another successful dive goes into the logbook. But decompression sickness will occur when bubbles become too large or are too numerous or are located at sensitive sites. The chances of developing decompression sickness are normally quite low but they increase with extensive bubble growth. Dan has observed decompression incidence rates ranging from the low point of 2 per 50,000 or 1 per 25,000 dives for Caribbean liverboard diving to 28 cases in 17,000 divers as is the case in cold water wreck diving. What would happen on a liverboard or wreck diving if a diver then flies home at a cabin altitude of a typical 8,000 foot commercial airline. As per Boyle's law, any bubbles that are there will expand by about a third and additional bubble growth would occur as dissolved nitrogen diffuses into the bubbles. So the risk of developing decompression illness is increased when divers fly. The recommended minimum pre-flight surface interval is 12 hours following single no decompression dives and 18 hours after multiple dives or multiple days of diving. More flexible guidelines are available in the United States Navy Dive Manual and many dive computers also predict or display when flying is deemed safe. However, the methods vary amongst computers. Diving at altitude is more complicated. Because of the lower atmospheric pressure that the diver returns to, the dive tables are affected it is as though they were diving deeper. While it is possible to compute separate tables for each altitude, testing the tables would be impractical. The more common practice is to apply empirical correction factors based on existing sea dive tables. The most familiar of these is described by E. R. Cross from 1967 and revised in 1970. For the sake of example, using the US Navy tables, an 18-meter dive at 8,000 foot would be the equivalent of a 24-meter dive. The dive can then be planned according to the 24-meter dive depth. If there are decompression stops, they should be corrected as well. Many dive computers have absolute pressure transducers and can be re-zeroed for surface altitude pressures. Since depth gauges are really pressure gauges, there's no need to convert from freshwater to seawater because the dive computer's pressure sensor does it automatically. Pneumatic gauges, on the other hand, are not recommended for altitude diving because they don't automatically correct. Another factor that should be considered is that a diver's tissues need to equilibrate to the change in atmospheric pressure. In other words, if a diver was at sea level and travels to altitude, they actually have more nitrogen in their bodies than they would have after spending 12 to 24 hours at altitude. Extreme altitude. Most altitude diving is conducted below 8,000 feet. Generally it's tolerated quite well, but high altitudes require acclimatization and oxygen partial pressure may become an issue. Acute mountain sickness can develop with sudden exposure to high altitude. Some of the highest altitude dives are reported at 12,500 feet in Lake Titicaca on the border of Peru and Bolivia. These were initially made in 1968 by Jacques Cousteau and later by others. Diving at altitude requires careful implementation of altitude correction factors, an adequate supply of oxygen for first aid and clear plans for emergency evacuations to a medical facility with a hyperbaric chamber.